last one is a, is a series of broadcast programs that we're developing with the public television affiliate in Duluth, WDSC. And the first one in the series, these are all going to be natural history programs. The first one is on the, uh, the night sky. And it is uh, titled, well, the, the name of it is, well, I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. In the process of developing all of this content for our kiosk and the smartphone application, the K-12 program, we made a strong connection with Travis Novitsky. Travis is a member of the Transportage Band uh, of Lake Superior of Chippewa. He is also, his day job is the manager of Transportage State Park. And he's an extraordinary uh, wildlife and uh, nature photographer and with a very, very strong interest in the night sky. So that was um, uh, it's really a wonderful relationship. He's been very, a great work with, very generous with his photos. So we have a lot of his content in these public outreach resources that we have on Lake Superior. Um, and we made a series of short, three short films with him a couple of year and a half ago or so, uh, kind of showcasing his work related to lake, river, and sky. I'm going to play the sky one because this is what ultimately got the public television affiliate in Duluth interested in the idea of an hour long documentary. To me, water water connects the earth and the sky. And a lot of times that's most evident when you're at an inland lake and you see the stars of the Milky Way reflecting in the surface of a nice calm lake. And you're gazing up at the Milky Way, which is just larger than life, it seems. And there's absolutely no wind on those nights. You can see the stars reflecting in the lake, almost the perfect reflection of the sky. No matter what's going on, no matter what kind of difficulty I might be having, I can come to a place like this and just lose myself in it and be kind of get lost in the mindfulness of that experience. There's that connection, right? Like you've got the water, which makes its cycle through evaporation, goes up into the atmosphere and comes back down as rain. It's all connected, just like everything in life is connected. And being there in those moments and seeing something that's so far away, and by that I mean the Milky Way, tied to something that's right there in front of you, that water, the surface of that lake, it makes you feel insignificant and kind of large all at the same time. And part of all of that part of that energy that ties everything together. That gives you a little flavor of both um, Travis's incredible photography, but also how he thinks about it. So um, just a, had a great time working with him on that. And um, talking to him, we just began to think about the fact that now, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, Voyagers National Park, Quetico Provincial Park have all been designated dark sky places by the International Dark Sky Association. Uh, there's a strong movement in Duluth, a lot of interest in managing light pollution, trying to reduce the impact of light pollution in Duluth, uh, and promoting uh, people's appreciation of this extraordinary resource that is available to folks in this region. And so we um, made a pitch to the uh, public television affiliate and they just gobbled it up. They said, this is really what's terrific. And uh, so Travis and I are co-producing this hour long program, which we are in the middle of right now. So this is this presentation is kind of giving you a preview of uh, some of the content we have there. And those bullet points talk about what this program is about. So kind of showcasing and really celebrating the region's extraordinary night skies. Um, and through Travis and other connections we've made in the indigenous community uh, here in the Arrowhead region, as well as in the Twin Cities, kind of exploring indigenous star knowledge. So, you know, the sky is something that's shared uh, by 
cultures all around the world, of course, and it, and it, different cultures have different concepts and relationships with the constellations and with celestial phenomena. So exploring all of that, celebrating these dark sky places that I just mentioned, and then educating people about light pollution. Uh, it's and this was a lot of this was really new to me. I just wasn't really aware of some of the impacts of light pollution on humans, wildlife, and uh, economy on energy consumption, and then encouraging light pollution reduction strategies. So that's kind of the goal of what the program's about. So I'm going to introduce you to some of the people that we're interviewing, that whose stories we're going to be weaving into this documentary. Travis is going to be kind of the thread that connects these different stories through this narration. And uh, so, but we're going to kind of weave in these different stories. So the first one is with Paul Bogart, who happens to be a colleague of mine at Hampton University. I didn't actually hadn't met him until we embarked on this project. He's written quite a bit about uh, the dark sky, about light pollution. He has a book called End of the End of Night, which is a fascinating book where he actually traveled around the world visiting different places to uh, kind of document and explore the experience of how we relate to how uh, artificial light is used in different places, the impacts of light on our uh, culture and so forth. So this is a little clip with Paul. <laughs> So for the end of night, I had some decisions to make, you know, where was I going to go? What was I going to try to see? What are the issues that I was going to investigate? And one of the first decisions I made was to start with some really bright places and to kind of work my way down to some really dark places. <laughs> So in the opening of the book, one of the first things I do was uh, go to the strip of Las Vegas and meet with the head of the Las Vegas Astronomical Society. So we took his telescopes down to the Las Vegas strip and set them up in front of the casinos and went stargazing. And that was just a, a great example of uh, not being able to see much of anything, right? Um, and Times Square in New York City was soon after that. Um, after that, I made a choice to go to London and to Paris. Um, London in part because I really wanted to see gas lamps, gas lighting, um, which is something that we can't see very many uh, places anymore, but that um, when artificial light first came to the big European cities, it was gas lights and people don't realize how different that was from what we see now, how much dimmer. Um, so I saw that in London and then of course moved to Paris and it was uh, a great place to go because they have spent so much time thinking about how they light their city. They're consciously creating uh, an atmosphere um, of lighting, of nighttime that will draw in tourists. It's, it's part of the appeal of the city as opposed to how so many things are lit across this country, certainly, which is just blast light at the structure um, as bright as you can make it. So not very creative, not very beautiful. And then from there, then I started going to some more, I guess, natural locations, some of the national parks in this country. And I'll tell you one experience of being out in um, Death Valley National Park in California. There was there were no clouds and it was a perfect night to be out there and I just had this vivid memory of standing looking north and looking to my right and seeing the stars rise out of the horizon uh, as you know this revolving night sky and fall off the edge of the earth in the west just that sense of you know this kind of thing and um, boy we just never get to see that anymore. But I was lucky I got to have that firsthand experience with uh, with real night, uh, real night sky, real darkness, a truly natural, um, natural night. We've become a really bright country <laughs> in terms of artificial light. Uh, and for example, anything east of the Great Plains is no longer naturally dark. Uh, eight of 10 
kids born in the US today will never live where they can see the Milky Way. We have taken what was once one of the most common human experiences, which is walking out the door at night and coming face to face with the universe. And we've made that one of the most rare of human experiences. So there are many costs to light pollution, right? There are economic costs, there are costs to uh, human health, there are costs to environmental health, but there are also these, what I think of as intangible costs, right? What do we lose when we no longer have this firsthand experience of coming face to face with the universe? Um, and I think they're vitally important, right? They impact uh, everything from uh, art, you know, who, all the young Van Goghs out there who aren't being inspired, right? All the, the painters, all the writers, all the musicians who are not having ex that experience of a real night. They impact our experience of contemplation, of, of meditation, of thinking about our place in the universe, of thinking about our, our relationship with the rest of the creation. That gives us something to think about. <laughs> um, one of the things Paul references in his book is something called the Borthel scale. And this is a graphic that depicts that. And this is a way of kind of categorizing the brightness or darkness of our skies. And it's a nine point scale. At the far right is level one, which is as dark as it gets. Uh, level nine is at the other end, which would be Las Vegas or Times Square. The Twin Cities is, you know, heart of the Twin Cities is probably, you know, at, sit between seven and nine. Getting out into suburban areas typically, you know, might be four or five, maybe getting down into three and then tech suburbs. And then we have our dark sky sanctuaries. We have the Boundary Waters and Voyagers, Quetico. Uh, and they're going to be at the lower end of the scale. So it's an interesting way to think about uh, and understand uh, our, you know, how our artificial light is impacting the sky. This is uh, an image from Google Earth. And uh, uh, I was going to share a little bit. I'm trying to explore this with you a little bit. But due to technical difficulties, I will just reference it. This is a light pollution map that, that you can, there's a, a file you can download and plug it into Google Earth and explore the entire Earth in terms of uh, light pollution impact. So it's sort of similar to that image in the film, uh, the little clip with Paul Bogart, where you could see how bright the eastern United States was. If you look really closely, um, you can see Minnesota here, the Twin Cities. These are actually um, oil and gas uh, flares in North Dakota there. And then you can see way up in northern Minnesota, uh, some of the dark areas that we have. And really, in the entire eastern half of the United States, that may be the largest, I believe, or maybe in northern Maine there. Um, in, in any event, this is a fun thing to explore. And you can you know, explore the entire world taking a look at that. Um, our next person is a cultural astronomer. Her name is Jessica Hein. I'm Jessica Hein, and I am a cultural astronomer. My research looks at the intersection of human culture and the night sky and why the night sky and stars are important to humans in different cultures, at different time periods across the world. People tend to think of the constellations, you know, there's the Greek constellations, so everybody thinks of the big bear and Orion the hunter and Taurus the bull, but every culture on the planet has had relationship with the sky and they see stars constellation groups that are relevant in their area you know the human eye sees patterns and they'll see patterns that are meaningful in their context like in the Ojibwe culture it a moose makes a lot more sense than an upside down flying horse and there are obviously differences even among the north american continent different tribes will have different teachings about a similar group of stars but there's also a lot of similarity. I would say one similarity that is pops up all over across the world 
is just this idea of the sky and the earth are connected, the above and the below, they're not separate. It's a participatory relationship. We're part of that process of this, like the rock we've seen in some cultures, looking at certain star constellations that's like the doorway to say the spirit world. And so the stars play a role between connecting like the physical world and the spiritual world as well. It's really fascinating what we can learn from cultures and perspectives and different ways of seeing the world that are different from what we think of every day. Western science is wonderful, but it's one particular way of engaging with the universe, and there are many others. I think there's value in all of them. So those perspectives of uh, um, are kind of establishing a broader context for thinking about uh, light, how artificial light is used uh, in our lives, uh, how different cultures think about um, think about their relationship with the heavens, with celestial phenomena, and from there we want to are we'll be taking a deeper dive into this region, kind of getting uh, uh, hearing voices of folks who can speak for. Uh, indigenous perspectives and other perspectives in this region. So Jim Rock is the next person we'll hear from. He is a Dakota astronomer, and uh, he's on the faculty of UMD. He lives in St. Paul. Uh, he gives a lot of presentations at the planetarium at UMD. And this is a wonderful film he created uh, that interprets um, Dakota conceptions of the Mississippi River and uh, its relationship to the Milky Way. I'm Taka P. Shandewa Stea and Ape Chiusa Pido, Ochete Shakoing, Oyate Shimataha, Wambi Hanyetu Imakia Pido, Damakota, Susituan, Dakota Himata. All my relatives, I speak to you today with a glad heart, offering my hand. My dad is Susituan Dakota of the Seven Starfire Nations, Ochete Shakoing, Oyate. My name is Jim Rock in English, Wambi Hanyetu. And Dakota, yeah. I was born at Imanijaska at Imachare. I was born at uh, St. Paul at near a place called Wakantipi, the cave uh, in which we have the drawings that tell something of our cosmic origins. So what I do is in a planetarium. I was, you know, trained in Western science, but always kept our own ways of thinking here. And the two legs have really come together well in that the word nucleosynthesis, it just means that atoms are made in stars. And we've always said we come from the stars and to the stars we return. We come from the earth and to the earth we return. The iron in our blood, the carbon in our body had to come from a sun before this sun. So we're recycled stardust, star stuff are us, I like to say. Mm -hmm. The Milky Way is like a river, not just any river, but Hahawakba or Wakpatanka, Wakpahaska, the big long river, the river of the waterfall. We find burial mounds near river. It's very intentional, it's not random. Our elders, those that have passed on, deserve the highest place near water to go back up to the stars, place of honor, by the water that flows. Chan, Chanwakam, Wakachan, the sacred tree, Sundance tree, the cottonwood tree, still the stars. That tree full of stars connects between sky and earth along rivers. It likes its feet wet, its roots. It's a bridge between the river down here with sparkling lights on it and the sparkling stars above. The Wanagi Tachanku, the spirit road, the road of spirits that we come from and go back to. And we need to be living in a good way so that we go back to that place where we come from. Um, with integrity, with generosity. So it's really a pleasure to work with Jim, and, and uh, we are exploring uh, some wonderful extended opportunities beyond his contribution to this particular documentary. Um, and next, uh, getting a little closer to home here in the North Country, 
um, we were really fortunate to establish a, a good connection with Carl Gaboy. Uh, Carl is an Ojibwe artist and wonderful storyteller, a uh, member of the Boys Sport Band. He lives just outside of Duluth. And um, he uh, has written, if you're unfamiliar with it, a fabulous book, which you're welcome to take a look at. It's called Talking Sky, um, that he co-wrote with Ron Morton. Ron is a, a geologist. Um, and in this book, uh, it's, it's a really fun uh, read, a really lively dialogue between the two of them where, they're, uh, where Carl essentially uh, tells uh, stories from Ojibwe culture that connect uh, understandings of the stars and the heavens with uh, natural phenomenon here in the boreal forest and traditional Ojibwe uh, cultural uh, lifestyles and so forth. Um, great storyteller. And what was really fun was um, Travis, the, uh, my co-producer from Grand Portage and Carl had never, they kind of met they knew of each other, they respected each other tremendously. And so we filmed a dialogue between the two of them. And um, Travis has, has shared with us that growing up on Grand Portage, he just never really got to know people within that community that, that had the star knowledge. Carl has been spending his whole life assembling, kind of putting pieces together, trying to reclaim some of these stories that um, have been part of Ojibwe culture. And so the, the dialogue was between an elder uh, Carl sharing this knowledge and, you know, just this really fun, authentic, exciting dialogue between the two of them. And uh, we kind of do more of that as well as we complete the film of this. So this is a little clip uh, out of that dialogue where Carl is talking about uh, the Milky Way from an Ojibwe perspective. For the Ojibwe, the Milky Way is the river of soul, or further west where there's more pathways over the landscape than there is water routes, they call it the path of soul, where you'd walk it. But in this part of the country, it would be the river. And what a beautiful river it is. It's brilliant and shining. One time I asked my dad, I said, what's Ojibwe heaven like? And he said, it's the greatest place in the world. It's just like here. And I said, you mean like with winter? And he said, yeah, it's just like here. He said, and mosquitoes? Mosquitoes? I said, yeah, it's just like here. What could be better? <laughs> so I'm thinking of be the Ojibwe who think of heaven as just the greatest place in the world. It's just like here. I'm just like here. If you lived an evil life, though, you you disappear into the cosmos and you're gone. There's no afterworld for you. When the Ojibwe talked about a person dying and going to the afterworld, you travel that river of soul. And the Milky Way has a band of beautiful light coming down to the horizon. And then there's another branch of it that forks off and then disappears. And People who've lived and done evil in their life took that other branch and would just disappear into the cosmos. Mm -hmm. But those that lived a, good, lived a good and proper life would continue on their journey to the afterworld, where there was, they came to a land of forests and prairies, um, with a full of game and full of all the ancestors that had died went on before you get reunited with them. And it's just like you. <laughs> so um, I'm going to explain this a little bit. So we're working with Carl to create, this is a star map, a circular 
illustration there, and it comes, it's included in this book. And each of the icons, the illustrations in the star map, is a different cultural story associated with celestial phenomena. So you can see the River of Soul kind of runs through the middle of it there. Um, and then the ones that are in yellow are four seasonal constellations recognized. And again, as Carl tells the story, he, his father shared a certain amount of information with him. He never, he always thought he'd find somebody that just knew all this stuff, but he never did. And so you get a, a story here and a story there. And in the course of his lifetime, he sort of assembled these interpretations of the night sky. So again, the, the, the four yellow ones are seasonal constellations that appear uh, during the indicated season. So on the far left here is Winter Maker, uh, present during the winter months. Lewis is in the autumn. Uh, Nana Bijou would be prominent now for summer. And the Great Panther uh, is in spring. And we're going to be we're working with him to create an interactive learning experience where he's able to click on you know, this web base or in kiosk and then our smartphone apps to click on these icons and then explore these stories. And what's beautiful is how they weave in not only uh, kind of um, maybe philosophical perspectives, but also really closely tied to environmental features of uh, the Arrowhead region, this, this area, and cultural practices. Um, so just for example, just to talk about a few of them, the moose I mentioned is, uh, is a sky constellation, uh, happens to coincide, it's, it has many of the same stars that it's in uh, Pegasus. Um, and I mentioned the great panther in spring. So he has, in the book, he tells stories, cultural stories about each of these um, each of these characters, each of these uh, subject matters about the spring. And then the, the third one, again, uh, the winter maker. And one of the things Carl has been able to do through his interpretation, if you recognize that, everybody know where that is? Everybody knows where that is. I'm going there tomorrow morning. So um, you can recognize the three prominent uh, figures here are the winter maker, the great panther, and the moose. And Carl was able to determine that there is one point during the uh, year, it's usually or it's always in early March, where at this particular location you can see all three of these constellations, even though they are seasonal. There's, you can't see them all at the same moment, but within a 24 hour period. So you get there, um, and just, to, just after sunset, uh, and I'm forgetting now which one would appear first, but um, uh, winter maker would be the most visible because it's still uh, kind of close to winter. But you can get glimpses of the moose and uh, the great panther as well. So, you know, that I thought was just a fascinating discovery that he, uh, and, and he kind of says, you know, this is mine. And I put these pieces together. He doesn't claim necessarily, there might be other people who would, you know, have other interpretations, but. Um, anyway, so that's one of the stories that we're going to be telling through this uh, process. Now, moving ahead to a few other topics here, I mentioned this idea that uh, Quetico, BWCA, and Voyager's National Park are all dark sky. The blade, well, um, Voyager is, is a dark sky park. Quetico is a dark sky park. BWCA is a dark sky sanctuary, I believe is the uh, actual term. And together, these three. They're international, they cross the Canadian border. And what this means is they, there's a fairly lengthy process that a park or a place like this needs to go through with the International Dark Sky Association in order to get this designation. Basically, it's just demonstrating, you know, quality, naturally dark skies. So this is all, this designation has come about just within the last uh, couple of years. So we've, uh, in the course of filming, we've traveled to all three locations and interviewed superintendents of Voyagers and Quetico and uh, one of the staff with the Forest Service with the BWCA who was really instrumental in getting that established. So it's really something to celebrate. You know, it kind of just is another, um, another aspect of the wilderness that is always over our heads, no matter where we are. These are places where you can get a very good uh, exposure uh, to the dark sky. The International Dark Sky Association is based in um, Tucson, Arizona. 
and they're involved in you know kind of conservation outreach but they you know big part of their work is is uh, kind of allowing places to become dark recognized dark sky places and it isn't only dark sky or you know national parks state parks so they, you could be a dark sky community and that doesn't mean you've got a pitch black sky at night it means that you're managing uh artificial light in your community in a way that tends to promote uh the ability to appreciate and see dark skies um and you can see this is a detail off of that pollution map that i showed you earlier and you can see faintly outlined the three parks the three dark sky sanctuaries and then these bright spots blue superior thunder bay marquette and so one of the challenges is, you know, for those to remain dark sky places is going to require these outlying communities, including Ely International Falls and the larger cities to manage artificial light in a way that doesn't diminish uh, significantly the dark skies of the sanctuaries. This is a little piece on impacts of light pollution, and it's focused on the city of Duluth, and it's from a, a film that we're it's next pure year. human physiology. Human beings haven't evolved to be exposed to artificial light at night. And so any kind of exposure to any kind of light has potentially negative consequences. Blue rich white light tends to be the worst kind of light for us to be uh, exposed to at night. There has been a day night cycle for nature for billions of years. And now we are radically changing that. We receive light between sunrise and sunset, and then it's darkness. We're just getting minimal light from the moon or, or you no, know, the star starlight. The advent of electrical lighting changed the shape of that light dark schedule that we have evolved to. We had the pleasure of talking with lighting expert Ian Ashton, who is the senior scientist for Sun Tracker Technology, and he took time to give us his expertise on the subject. In order for the body to prepare itself for going to sleep, the pineal gland produces a hormone called melatonin, and that helps essentially turn off our brain and allow us to sleep. Interesting thing about the pineal gland is controlled by a small section of the brain, which receives light signal from the retina of our eyes. And it's mainly blue light, which is detected. If there's too much blue light, the brain interprets that as well. It's still daylight out. There's no point in producing melatonin and going to sleep. By exposing yourself to light at night, you are also disrupting your biological clock. So you're literally changing the timing of your biological clock such that physiological responses, including cellular growth and proliferation, is going to happen at the wrong time. Shift workers have uh, a really hard time because they're being exposed to artificial light at night in a way that human beings have never evolved to. There's a vast body of literature, epidemiologic studies in humans, uh, as well as controlled lab studies in humans and animal models that all show how light exposure, particularly shift work, is associated with breast cancer. There are studies that show a link between shift work and prostate cancer shift work in obesity. Melatonin has been shown to reduce tumor growth. If you've got less melatonin, then that will enable the tumors to proliferate. So that'll be a subject we're going to be uh, taking a look at. And also not just that is really just about impacts on humans, but on wildlife is significant and bird life uh, and uh, insects, a whole variety of species are profoundly impacted by uh, our use of artificial light. Um, so I am just wrapping up here, kind of leaving you with some things that all of us can do. Again, this will be part of our focus to uh, help uh, manage and use responsibility our artificial light in our lives. Uh, and they're listed here: lighting only what you need to light, and for outdoor lighting, you know, putting. Uh, uh, shields around the light so it's not blasting into your neighbor's uh, living room, uh, but also so that light just doesn't escape up into the atmosphere, which is one of our causes of light pollution. Energy efficient bulbs, shielding lights, as I just mentioned, using timers so you're only using light when you need them. And of course, the benefits are, you know, this is strikes me that this is, you know, it's such a sort of a no brainer environmental uh, concern that, I mean, we can have an impact just by turning off. You know, used by not consuming as much light and light and making simple changes like this. And, you know, there are economic benefits by not wasting light. 
Uh, obviously, energy consumption is a significant uh, part of uh, climate change impact. So this is a, a simple thing. It seems like something people can write good rally behind. Uh, it's not altering, you know, our use of lands, uh, private uh, property issues, that kind of stuff. So this will be a focus. Um, and I'll kind of leave this with a question. The idea of could Ely become a dark sky community? What might that mean? What would it take to do that? And I'm not the expert on that, uh, although uh, I am uh, connected with and know some of the folks at IDA. So if that's something you're interested in pursuing, I can provide some context that uh, could be explored if that were of interest to you. And in doing so, these are some of the communities that you would be joining around the country that already are designated as dark sky communities. And uh, in Duluth, there's a movement to try and have, you can even have a dark sky area or dark sky place. So in Duluth, the lake walk, uh, the entire you know, Minnesota Point and uh, the lake walk area could be, that portion of the city could be designated as a dark sky place. So there's different ways that um, uh, that can come about. So that is the end of my talk. Happy to, you know, uh, welcome your comments and questions if you have them. Ace has got the microphone. He'll bring it over. Thanks, Ace. So what we the world up against is the Christian stuff about light and the negative associations of dark and evil, um, which is such an unhelpful metaphor, all that stuff. But it's really prevalent. I, I find myself being a, 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 somebody who celebrates darkness, and people think I'm weird. Yeah. Satanic. Right. Um, interesting thought, um, and kind of associated with that, the, the, just the going deeper into how it is that our cities in particular have become so bright. I mean, you think about a gas station is on a corner and they have a lot of bright lights and then another gas station wants to get established on the opposite corner. Well, how are they gonna attract more traffic? Well, they want to at night, wanna be brighter than your neighbor. And so there's this crazy you know, uh, dynamic that happens. And then there's also a lot of psychology around darkness and safety. You know, there's a common perception. Well, of course, we need it to be bright in order to be safe. But uh, there's it, it really interesting research about the relationship of, of artificial light and safety. That in fact, too much light can create shadow areas that you don't see because your eyes are so dark, uh, constricted, your pupils. So it's easier for somebody to be hiding in a dark shadow area than a brightly lit situation. Or in parking lots that are really overlit, somebody who might be thinking about breaking into cars doesn't need a flashlight to see what's in the car. They can just look in there and see what's in. So there are actually, there have been the correlation of studies that show correlation of safety to darkness uh, are very, it's very nuanced. Obviously, you know, pitch bark, pitch dark uh, conditions can be dangerous. So it isn't like light is bad. It's just, you know, lighting things thoughtfully. Yeah, other, other comments. Yeah, we are in one of the dark sky areas in the country. Uh, we live 20 miles out of town. And on a, you know, a clear night when there's no moon, it's pretty dark except for the loom of Ely 20 miles away. And I think I think that's probably true, you know, on the other side of Ashwood Lake and out of Chagua and Birdside. Uh, that it might be pretty dark, except for the loom of Ely. Uh, you suggest that Ely could be a dark sky community. I like the idea. I'd like to hear more about it. Who can, who, is it the city council? Is it individual businesses? Who, who gets to make the decision on this? Who funds the changes? How do we go about it? You're talking to a group here that could push for it. Um, but we need a little direction. That sounds great. And I'm afraid I'm not the really person to guide you through that process because that's just not my expertise. Although uh, one thing I can tell you up in Voyagers, the Voyager 
Conservancy, which is the nonprofit group that is the friends of Wedgwood National Park, has been talking to some of their gateway communities, and it's begun to have they've begun to have conversations with folks with uh, folks in the international falls and so forth. And they're because they're you know again they want to uh, help assure um, the dark sky status of Wedgwood National Park, so it's very dependent upon uh, the neighboring communities. So uh, that would be one place you could connect with, you know, what are they learning? One of the interesting things I have, we've been working with those folks, they were saying that they've had some public meetings or some, you know, meetings with different constituencies in International Falls. And the argument that tends to be best received is, is just related to the economics of tourism. If this is, uh, if this can be a way to draw uh, more visitors uh, that, you know, it was the one piece that, uh, seem to have the, the biggest impact. The, the part of the part of the argument, but you know, this might be something that you know future meetings could certainly explore in greater depth. Will your documentary touch on the uh, light pollution caused by so many human uh, satellites? Yeah, yeah. Actually, the uh, Woman uh, Jessica Heim, the cultural astronomer, she, that's one of her areas of research. So uh, we will be talking about that, and that is that's something again. I was not aware of that at all. But the incredible uh, proliferation of, of communication satellites in the sky is a, becoming increasingly a significant source of light pollution, uh, and that, that 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 is one of the things we will be talking about. Yeah, I think there's a question here. Yeah, I'm talking about Charles Arboy, the master of uh, associations between fins and Ojibwe, and you mentioned that uh, that, was, that was mentioned in the uh, in the presentation about the uh, the uh, stars, the constellation representing that on the show, the uh, trickster slash creator in Ojibwe history. Um, who who was the Creator in the Kalabala. And the three main characters. What was it? Anyway, one of Kalabala's recent paintings, this is in a gallery down in Duluth that features Indian painting, is a picture of it's a painting of and it's an expensive one, like it doesn't afford it. Of Anna Bourgeois, the trickster, and the creator from the Kalabala. Lounging on a log in front of a campfire after a day of fishing with a canvas tent in the back. <laughs> Which is, of course, the real treat. That's pretty fun. Yeah. 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 I was wondering if that, I don't think that's included in Talking Sky, but anyway, he, he, I remember seeing that. I was at that gallery. That's a, a sort of a fun story. Yeah, because Carl's. Is part finish as well. So, right in the back there. Oh, oh. oh. I wrote that book, Talking Sky, wrote a book called Talking Rock. Mm -hmm. And they took the same approach where they had the Ojibwe interpretation of the scientific uh, geologic picture from the ice cold down. Right, right. So, there is, uh, for those of you who didn't catch that in the microphone, uh, Ron Morton, the geologist, and Carl have co authored a book called Talking Rocks about geology. And uh, that's we're going to be working with the two of them to bring the story to life in the same way that we're uh, working with wow. Travis and Carl and 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 uh, kind of using that same approach, like a map of Minnesota where you could click on Pikestone National Monument and other places of significance and kind of learn kind of both the the uh, scientific Western interpretation, the geologic scientific geologic interpretation of, of some of these important places, as well as the cultural Ojibwe perspective. So we're very excited about that as well. Yeah. Oh, hello. I'm just curious if you had said when this documentary is set to premiere. Yeah. That's one question. And a follow up Are you aware that there is set to be an end of the road film festival in Erie mm -hmm. to which you could submit this film potentially? Did not know that. Um, great, great. When is that happening? The Winter Festival, second weekend, February 9th or okay. something like that. Great. 
So yeah, it's um, the broadcast is scheduled to be, or the, the documentary is scheduled to be broadcast on WDSB in Duluth uh, in early December. Uh, and we are gonna, gonna be planning to do some premiere events. And we've talked a little bit about doing one here in Ely. Uh, there'll be at least one in Duluth. There'll be uh, at least one in the Twin Cities and maybe Grand Marais as well. So those will be you know, kind of around the time that it becomes available. Uh, through WDSE, and then they're going to market it to other PBS stations uh, or throughout, you know, whoever's interested. And we're hoping because, you know, we went up to Atticoke and included, we're going to, you know, include a focus on uh, Quetico. So hopefully uh, Canadian public television would, would be interested in picking up. And we had that success with the Chase by the Life program with Brandenburg. They do broadcast throughout all of Canada, throughout all of Northern uh, North America and Scandinavia. So our hope is that, you know, this is a regional story because it's really grounded here, but obviously the themes are much broader and, and particularly by bringing in some of, you know, Paul Bogart's travels around the world, visiting dark sky places and kind of the cultural astronomy piece, you know, kind of allow people, no matter where they are, to think about this and connect with it and learn more about our part of the world here. But, uh, you know, it, it, because it's a relevant story for them as well. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's just the neighbors that look to the north and the right, and they are looking at a like a spotlight beaming out on the land. Mm -hmm. Because you don't see it, but it just says them. And uh, I'm just curious: is there any kind of enforcement that you're aware of that a person can have to say that this is kind of a two party? I, I don't know in particular about that, um, but I can say a couple of things about it. One of the things is the impact of lights in Duluth on uh, aquatic species is thought to extend as far north or as far up the shore as the Knife River. So 10, 15 miles has an impact on uh, you know, the fish and other aquatic species. So, uh, and when we interviewed the uh, Ann Schwaller is the uh, Forest Service employee who was with uh, works on boundary waters and was instrumental in having the BWCAW designated as a dark sky place. One of the things she is concerned about, one of the messages she really wants people to get out there is there's a, apparently, I, I haven't witnessed it firsthand, but in the boundary waters, people are bringing in a lot more lights. You know, they'll string uh, battery powered lights around their campsites and that kind of stuff. So even in the wilderness setting, you know, those are things people can do to, to minimize those impacts. And for sure, just the way sound carries on water, light, you know, reflects, obviously. So a spotlight pointed out on a lake would be something neighbors would certainly notice. So, yeah. And of course, you know, this whole, how do you enforce this kind of stuff? It's a tricky business, you know, uh, and, and I, my understanding is different communities just approach it in different ways. Obviously, public education is a big part of that. But I think there were a couple other. I was wondering if you had any communication with any of the power companies regarding this. Uh, no, we haven't. Interesting. Yeah, it might be interesting to include that in the session. Probably won't have time for it with all the other stories we need to get into this power line program initially. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that there have been a group that uh, worked on an initiative for a dark sky evening. And um, I don't know how persistent they were or what obstacles they met. Um, as far as I know, it's not, it hasn't been active um, recently, but um, I'm very interested in it. And if any of you are, my name's Betty Firth, and uh, you could give me your names. And we could figure out what, what to do next. Yeah. Returning for a moment to the dark sky map that you showed of the coal or of the United States, or particularly Minnesota, I got to wondering uh, as you look at the United States, that glow at night, what percentage of the daily energy consumption would that be? I mean, if, if that's what we look at at night when we're doing nothing. <laughs> no sleeping, maybe. Anyways, I don't know. Four finalities, you got the raw gas. I don't. I just, I don't. Yeah. So 
that. So I think it's a great question. You know, what are the, I mean, the question would be, or part of that question is, what are the energy costs of that? And that's, yeah, it's a great question. I don't know the answer. Okay, last question. Okay, last one. Oh, that's a question on me. Um, um, I was kind of surprised when you said the uh, uh, the input you got, I think, from International Falls was the, um, the tourist uh, attraction. Um, I was wondering, um, it seems to me that there's pushback from businesses, and I was thinking casinos, where you have Indians who are already making some money for their people, which is great, but they often use those searchlights, skylights to advertise them. And I was wondering, it seems to me there'd be more of a pushback from the economic standpoint um, than, uh, than the opposite way. Interesting. Can't add anything to that. Interesting question. Okay, I guess that's it.